Come on, y'all smile at me now. Y'all know I'm picking with you. Amen. Well, listen, tonight may be a little bit different. I'm going to um, continue on the series that I started, gosh, weeks ago before we got into Easter and kind of came out of that. And I just, I, just, I just really felt that God was shifting some things. And, you know, of course, I preach. Anybody come out of Lodabar Sunday, by the way? Amen. I've heard, man, I've just heard a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of people. That's just such an awesome text. I mean, some of these texts in the Bible doesn't really have to have a good preacher. You can just, some of the texts just preach for themselves. And uh, that text about uh, uh, Mephibosheth and Lodabar and Zeba and all those guys just has that ability to preach. And that's the first time I actually preached out of that passage. But I promise you, I'm going to probably preach that thing in some of the nations because uh, I know it preached to me. I felt like if it didn't, nobody else get nothing, I got something. But anyway, with that, I, I, I know we had started on uh, last day's events, and we dealt with a number of things, and I'm going to be dealing on Wednesday night over the next couple of weeks, and I want to encourage you to, to come out, because some of the things that I'm talking about are very, um, uh, gosh, they're, 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 how can I say this, they're, uh, some of the issues that I'm going to be dealing with are issues that we're going to see happen this year, Okay according to the Jewish calendar and, and, and such. And, and I'm going to be talking about some of that tonight. And, you know, we've talked about a lot of these different signs that point to the last days. Now, I remember when I first started going to church, they was preaching about the last days. For, for, for hundreds of years, they've been preaching about the last days. But I think as we learned when I began to get into this series, one of the things that separates our season of, of, of history from previous generations is when Israel got birthed as a nation. Always remember this. Israel is God's prophetic time clock. Remember that. When you see things happening in Israel, when you see things that are being fulfilled prophetically in Israel, it points to the end times. You know, this Bible is, is enriched in Judaism. It's, the Old Testament was all about the Hebrews. It was all about the Israelites. Jesus was a Jew. Amen? I'm glad he, he wasn't white. I'm glad he wasn't black. He brown. He got the black and the white and the, all the other names. He's all wrapped up in all of it. Amen. So if you see a white Jesus, that's wrong. If you see a black Jesus, that's wrong. If he's Hispanic, he might be closer. But, but, but the truth is, he, he was Jewish, right? And, and that's what our salvation was birthed out of, Judaism. And there's so much that has happened in, in the last hundred years uh, that has affected Israel but when it affects Israel, it affects the world. Now, you hear some of the preachers, uh, such as John Hagee, that's very pro-Israel. And let me, let me just make this statement unapologetically. I am very pro-Israel. Boy, I got a lot of response right there. The Bible says, blessed are those that bless Israel, and cursed are those that curse Israel. So I am very pro-Israel. I've been to Israel twice. Denise and I went in the year 2000, then I went in the year of 1998. And I love Israel because so much of our Christian roots are rooted in Judaism. And rooted in the Old Testament, the Scriptures tell us, is a picture or a shadow of things to come. When you look at the Passover lamb, in the Old Testament, and it's ironic. Now, I'll probably touch on a little bit of that tonight because of the parallels of what happened even with Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection with Jewish feast days. And oftentimes, there are great historical events that have taken place on Jewish feast days. And not just on Jewish feast days. I mean, we see it in the life of Jesus. You know, Jesus was crucified. Who knows what feast he was crucified on? Passover. Feast of Passover. And at the very same time of the day, the third hour of the day, while the priest was binding up the lamb to the altar over in the outer court, Jesus at the very same time was being crucified on Golgotha. As that lamb was being bound on Passover, oh, come on, somebody, Jesus was being nailed to a cross over here on a hill on the day of Passover. Then, then the Feast of Unleavened Breads when he was buried. And then he resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits. And you see those parallels. The church was birthed on what day? The Feast of Pentecost. 
was when the church was birthed. And so oftentimes you can tie prophetic things, end time things, to Jewish feast days, to the Jewish calendar. Not our, English, not, not our, our calendar, but to the Jewish calendar. And I'm going to talk about something uh, that John Hagee made real popular. He wrote a book, Four Blood Moons. Tetrads. Have you heard about that, right? John Hagee wrote a book. He's done a lot of teaching on it. Came from a guy by the name of Mark Blitz. Was a guy that actually discovered it. He was, he was. Uh, I was watching a little testimony of how he kind of happened over uh, these uh, different uh, tetrads through history, and when they fell on Jewish feast days, oftentimes something very, very uh, important happened with Israel and affected the world. And so with that backdrop or with that understanding, I'm going to talk about the four blood moons a little bit tonight. I'm probably going to use some stuff. If you listen to John Hagee some, you may hear a little bit of what he's taught or some of what Mark Blitz has taught. But Mark was kind of the guy, He, when he was younger, he studied astronomy and he loved the stars and he loved those things. And he became a believer. Then he got baptized in the Holy Ghost and became a spirit-filled believer. And he was up one night night in the middle of the night and and kind of looking at these lunar eclipses and and their frequencies and how often they would happen and then he he noticed that they were happening on Jewish feast days and and uh, when he began to research he found out throughout history there were several different occasions that these tetrads now tetrad is basically four sooner uh, I mean lunar eclipses four that coincide at the same time or in a sequence four of them that fall in a row on Jewish feast days that's what they call a tetrad okay it's four lunar eclipses full lunar eclipses that fall on Jewish feast days you say where is that in the Bible you know well let's look at some scriptures you okay now I'm gonna teach you a little bit tonight is this gonna be okay y'all now if I don't shout on you or spit on anybody everybody's gonna be okay right Matthew chapter 24 we're gonna look at a few verses here then I want to break this down. I know this is going to be a little bit more in a teaching mode and uh, whatnot, but I, I want to get this to you because I believe that as we look at Scripture, Scriptures point to things. And it's not to encourage us. It's not, I don't believe in doom and gloom messages. But I do believe the church ought to be awakened and the church ought to realize the day and hour we're living in. And if we don't realize that we're living in the last of the last days, then we deceived. Now, no man knows the day of the hour. Let me, let me just state that right up front. I'm not trying to tell you a date and a time. Now, some of these other guys jump out there and do it, and you know what I've, you know what I've said all along. Anytime somebody said Jesus is coming at such such time on such such day, you go ahead and write it down on your calendar. He ain't coming then. Because no man knows the day. No man knows the hour. Jesus doesn't even know. Not the angels in heaven. That's what the scriptures tell us. Only the Father knows the moment he's going to say, okay, son, go get your bride. Now, I'm looking for that day. How many believe Jesus is coming back? I still believe in a literal rapture. I know there's some teaching kingdom theology and different, 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 different understandings and whatnot. I still believe he's coming back just like the Bible said. He's coming back. And I believe he's coming back in the fullness of time. But I believe just as the word says that that day will not come upon children of light unaware. I believe the people of God will sense and know the times and seasons that God has released in the earth. And the times and seasons that are indicators of his second coming. Amen. We've talked about a lot of those things. But we're going to get this four blood moon thing tonight, okay? Matthew chapter 24 verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. Matthew 24, 29. The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. In other words, there will be an eclipse. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Now, look in Joel chapter 2. Look in Joel chapter 2. We can throw that up. I'm skipping one. I'm going to come back to Genesis chapter 1, you guys. Y'all do a great job on that iMag. Y'all doing good. Y'all way ahead of me. Joel chapter 2, verse 30. And I will show wonders in the heaven and in the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Everybody say the moon into blood. Or a blood moon. It looked like blood. Now, I remember, I guess it was last year, one of the one of the lunar eclipses and it was 
I don't believe it was a super moon, and I'll tell you what that is a little bit later on, but it was a, it was a very large moon. It was, man, it was so big as I was coming to my house, and it was just coming over the horizon, and it was one of those blood moons, and it just gave me chills. Have any of y'all ever seen any of those? Those eclipses. Now, now lunar eclipses are, are, you know, they can be somewhat frequent. But tetrads, four of them, falling on feast days in the last 2,000 years. Listen to me. In the last 2,000 years, there have only been eight tetrads that fell on Jewish feast days. Eight in 2,000 years. We are on the tail end of the last tetrads. There were two in 2014. There was one. In April, Feast of Passover, there was a lunar eclipse, and there's one coming up in September, which will be the final, final uh, full moon. And it's, it's not, I mean, lunar eclipse. And it'll not just be a, a lunar eclipse. It will be what they call a supermoon. Now, what that means is the moon at different times as it rotates around the earth, it, there, there are different points that the moon will become as close to the earth as, as it ever is before. And that's when it's a full moon, and they call it a super moon. That's when the moon looks real big. Any of you ever seen that? You know what I'm talking about, right? And they call that a super moon. Well, when this, it's, it's amazing during the same time of this last tetrad, the last uh, uh, lunar eclipse, which will fall on the Feast of Tabernacles this year, September, uh, uh, what is it, September the 28th? Let me be sure I'm right on that date. September the 28th of this year, Feast of Tabernacles, will be a, in, in Jerusalem, it will be a super moon, super blood moon on the Feast of Tabernacles, which will be the fourth blood moon in this sequence of tetrads. There have only been eight in the last 2,000 years. Now, several of those in the last 2,000 years, when they took place, something very, very significant happened. Okay, one of them, and some of you may have heard this stuff, one of them, one of the tetrads happened in the year, let's see if I can get my, let me get my scriptures right here, let me get my dates right here, in the year of 19, excuse me, in the year of 1492, the Spanish Inquisition, 1492. Basically what happened then, Jews were expelled and because of that, Christopher Columbus was one of those that discovered America. But the, the Spanish Inquisition, it's referred to, it was during those two years that there were uh, blood moons. And so that was an instrument of one that came to this country and founded America. Christianity was birthed. I, I mean, that's pretty significant. Because America is the greatest Christian nation the world has ever known, right? There's never been another nation in the history of humanity that's emerged. It's been Israel, God's people, and America. There's never been a greater nation that's emerged out of the earth that has carried Christianity. And we are still, even with some of the statistics and some of the things that are happening in our nation and, and, and in many different areas, we are still the number one mission-sending nation concerning Christianity in the world. And we still are a Christian nation. Can I get an amen out there? Amen. And so you, you have these tetras. Here's another one that took place. Well, let me, let me go ahead and read the rest of the scripture here. Uh, there, I will show you wonders in heavens and in the earth. Joel 2 and 31. Blood, fire, pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And here's, here's another one. Revelation chapter 6 verse 12. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. It's Revelation 6 and 12. And let me, let's look at one other text, okay? I want you to look at this one. Because this, this particular scripture right here, I believe, points a lot to these blood moons and how they can be signs for us. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. Y'all still with me tonight? I know I'm kind of throwing some things out there. But Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night 
I'll wait on you. I hear some people turning pages. Genesis 1 and 14. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens and to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. The lights in the firmament of the heavens divide the day and from the night. We know the moon is what lights the night up, right? And they are there for signs. Everybody say signs. So these are signs. And the word seasons here is a very interesting word in the Hebrew. It's moab, M-O-A-D, moab, moab, M-O-A-D. And it means divine feast. You know, you would think, for signs and seasons, it would mean like winter, summer, fall. But it's, that's, not really the trend, that's not really the original meaning of this Hebrew word. It actually means uh, divine feast or divine appointments. So the moon and the sun will be signs for divine appointments, for set times in, in, in God's program. And as I said earlier, and I want to reiterate it a little bit, it was on... Passover, Jesus was crucified. How many know that didn't happen by coincidence? Our Messiah was crucified as the Lamb to the very hour, probably to the very second, that the priest was slaying the Lamb on the Temple Mount. Jesus was a picture, of course, of that Lamb, but he was on Passover being slain. Then the Feast of Eleven Breads, he was put in the grave. Then the Feast of First Fruits. You know, Jesus said, I'm the first, firstborn among many brethren. He was resurrected on the day of first fruits. And then Pentecost. So here on these feast days, we see significant things that happen, of course, in the ushering in of the Messiah. In the Messianic age, we see these things that took place sometimes to the very hour, if not the second, paralleling with feast days. So to look at feast days and even look at the, the blood moons, as we've seen these few scriptures here that deal with the sun being turned into blood, being a blood moon, these things indicate. Now, I'm not saying September the 28th, Jesus is going to come. I don't know when he's going to come, okay? So don't, don't, don't walk out of here where well, Pastor said he's coming. I don't know. Listen, I don't know if anything significant is going to happen on September 28th. I believe that there's things that are heading. I believe there's some things, as I said earlier, part of this year, that I believe are going to be happening this year. I believe there's going to be some very significant things that are going to happen, not only in America, but I believe in the earth. I believe there's some shaking. I believe there's some things that God is going to realign. I believe there's some things that are going to happen. I, I feel that strongly in my spirit. Now, God hadn't given me no word in a day, and I'm very cautious about that. I mean, I, I have in the past. God has given me prophetic words for people. I Remember, if Ed Little John was here, he could tell you. I prophesied to him within so many weeks he would meet his wife. And to the very day, he met Sonia. Amen. But I'm very cautious about dates and times. I want to know I'm here in the Holy Ghost. Amen. So you've got to be careful with setting dates and times. And, and so, you know, I'm cautious in releasing this. But I do believe that there are enough parallels that we see that have happened historically. Here's another thing. You had, listen, in the last, let me give you some of these, let me give you some of these statistics. Uh, let, me, let me back up here. I want to give you some of this right here. Okay. The, from, this, from this last lunar eclipse on the Feast of Tabernacles in September, there will not be another tetrad, another four blood moons happening for 400 years. So this is the last one for the next 400 years. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles is also referred to as the Feast of Engathering. It's also called the Feast of Booths. It's when the Israelites had come out of Egypt, and God had delivered them, and they built those booths. They built those uh, uh, little huts to live in the wilderness, and it was symbolic of their, their, of course, their deliverance and from Egypt, but it was symbolic of God's supernatural protection and supernatural covering. But it's the last of the feast days, the Feast of Tabernacle, and so it's there. When you look uh, in, uh, according to NASA's website, and look at some of these tetrads, as I said earlier, there were only eight in the last 2,000 years. And when you look at the ones that have happened, there have been, this is the third set in the last 100 years, which is pretty odd. 
Tetrads are odd because on an average, there's only one uh, lunar eclipse a year and a half. When they, when, since they've tracked it in history, they say on an average, a, lunar, a full lunar eclipse takes place every year and a half. So to have four lunar eclipses, full lunar eclipses in a two-year period and them hitting on feast days is very, very rare. Okay? And so when you look at that, let me realize God knew when the four, when the four blood moons were going to happen. Amen? He knew exactly before history ever even began. Well, let's talk about the three. That took, well, even, even let's back up a little bit more. Here, it, it, go back in history. I talked about 1492. But even back up before then. Guess what happened in 70 AD? 70 AD. In 70 AD, according to NASA, and they tracked this stuff. 70 AD. You say, well, they wasn't now. I don't know how they go backwards and track all this stuff. But they, they know how, you know how computers can do stuff. But they say in 70 AD, there was a tetrad. Elm that fell on the feast days, according to the Jewish calendar, if you back it up. Uh, you know what happened in 70 A.D.? 70 A.D. is when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in 70 A.D. It was a very, you know, it wasn't a good thing. It was in, in that sense of it. But in one sense it was because when the Romans came in and destroyed Jerusalem, what happened was it dispersed the apostles all over the world. They began to carry the gospel out as that Roman regime came in and just really began to, to destroy and try to annihilate the Jews. And, and when we were in Israel, there's a place there that's um, uh, called Masada. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of Masada. Masada is a place uh, near the Dead Sea, and it's basically a, a mountain. It's like if you see a mountain, it's like somebody just took and cut the top just like slice the top of the mountain off, and it's real steep, and it's got this flat, flat uh, place up there. Herod had one of his palaces built up there. You can see for, you can see over into Jordan. I mean, it's just a beautiful view up on Masada. But when the Romans had come into Jerusalem, and uh, they were jo they were killing all the Jews in Jerusalem, there was these Jewish zealots they call them that fleed up to this place called Masada, and they held off the Romans for three and a half years. And the reason being, their only, the only way the Romans could come up and attack Masada, it was just a narrow trail that they could go so they couldn't come up in mass numbers. And they were able to just keep them waned off. And what they actually ended up doing is they ended up building these dirt ramps. And these dirt ramps, I'm talking about dirt ramps all the way up the side of a mountain, so they could get their battering rams and so they could go over the wall of Masada. And it took them about three and a half years to actually get up over Masada. And what they did, the Jews did there. And they used the slaves that they had got from Jerusalem, the captives, to build the ramp. And right before they were going to go over the next day, all the Jews decided, we're not going to be slaves. And they all committed suicide, about 900 of them, on the top of Masada. So it's, it's, it's an amazing story. Matter of fact, where Masada is in, in Israel, the Dead Sea right there, Jordan's on the other side, and ever so often the Israeli warplanes will fly over Masada. I know when we were up there, ever so often there's a couple, a couple of those F-16s would fly over. And they got this real big sign up there on, on the top of Masada, and it says, Masada never again. Powerful statement. But anyway, that's nothing to do with the message. I just thought it was a little interesting. Amen. You might have learned a little bit of something if you never heard that before. But Masada is a, is a unique place there in Israel. So we look 70 A.D. when the temple was destroyed in, in Israel. Uh, I mean, um, uh, the Jews were, were uh, destroyed there. There was, there was those four eclipses. Even in 32, 33 A.D., which is around the time, of course, we've already talked about uh, Jesus and the Passover and everything, but a lot of people don't 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 know. And and I learned this through Mark Blitz and some of the other other guys that I was looking at studying some of this stuff. That there were tetrads in 32, 33 A.D. That's the time that Jesus was crucified, buried, and resurrected. In 32, 33 A.D., there were those tetrads. I mean, that's a very important time in history. Amen. Here's another one. There were, there were a set of tetras. I was talking about the last three in, in, in this period of 100 years. Am I boring y'all with this? Are y'all okay with this? Now, y'all know I like to preach. You know, I, like to, I don't want to bore nobody now. But 
uh, in the last hundred years, there have been three sets of these tetras. One of them uh, I, 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 I kind of alluded to. In, uh, but here, here's one happened in 1949-1950, okay? That was the two years. Remember, the tetrads, if they're going to fall on Jewish feast days, it's got to be two one year and two the next year. And those happened in 1949-1948. Who can tell me what happened in 48-49? Israel became a nation in 1948. Amen? They became a nation. Later, well, actually, May 14th, they were declared a nation. There was a great war that took place. There was three, four different nations, if I'm correct on my history here. Uh, there were at least three. I think there were four different Arab nations attacked them all on the day right after they were birthed as a nation. Israel defeated all of them. Why? Because God was fighting for Israel. Amen? The Tetras happened... 1949 and 1950, right around that same time, Israel was birthed in a, as a nation. Here's the next set of tetras that take place. They happen in 1967. Can anybody tell me what happened in 1967? Anybody know? Six-day war. Anybody ever heard of six-day war? Phenomenal war. When you look at the statistics, I went, one time I did research on all this, and I went to the library and just got secular books that had uh, different uh, statistics on how many Arab tanks, how many Arab planes, how many Arab soldiers versus how many Israeli soldiers and, and all of that. It was referred to as a six-day war. That's when Israel took back Jerusalem, 67. That's the second Tetrad in 1960. That's when Jerusalem came back under Israeli control. Remember the West Bank and all of that, Golan Heights. All of that was taken in the Six-Day War. It was during that, that tetran that that took place. And so it seems like that there's a pattern. And, you know, when we look even last year when ISIS really began to uh, uh, take off and started really persecuting Christians and Jews and anybody that wasn't Muslim. And as we're reading and watching the news now, it's almost a weekly, if not a daily basis, we're hearing about some massacre or some group of Christians or Jews that are being killed somewhere in the world. And this has been, how many know this stuff? How many realize this stuff has been escalating the last two years? How many know that? I mean, you know, I can't remember hearing about Christians being beheaded that much. I know that throughout history, and y'all heard some of the stats of those that have been martyred for the gospel. But it's happening now on an accelerated rate. It, we're seeing it like never before. And it's right in the midst of these four blood moons. You say, Pastor, what's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen. I know who holds the future, though. And the main thing is we need to understand the hour that we're in because it is an hour, has to be an hour of urgency for us because we have to realize that there are people around us that may not make it if the rapture were to take place or if something were to happen very, very drastically or, or you know, whatever may come down the pike. If people around us don't know the Lord, we are ambassadors of God and we have an assignment to reach them with the gospel. Amen? And, and you know what happens to us sometimes, guys? Some of us that have been Christians a long time, we ain't got no sinner friends. Some of the best evangelists and some of the best people that God uses to reach people are people that just got born again because they still got all them relationships out there. Some of us have been Christianized and been insulated in our Christianity and you know I start thinking thinking about my how many friends I got that, that are that are not believers you know I look at my own self it's so easy for us to get in our Christian bubble and forget about people all around us that don't know Jesus because see when he comes back ain't nobody gonna have time to get ready the Bible says in the twinkling of an eye Thessalonians says the trump of God shall sound. The dead in Christ will rise first. You and I which are alive and remain will meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, I'm not trying to say Jesus is coming on September 28th. Do not hear that, okay? I don't know when he's coming. But I do believe that there are significant things that are hap have already happened. Even during the, the first Set of these tetras, the Hamas and Israeli war that intensified during that time last year. 
That was right around that time. You know, and we look, you know, and, and, and the nations of the earth seem to be turning more and more away from Israel. Even America. Y'all don't get quiet on me now. Even America is turning more and more away f- from Israel. The moment we cut ourselves off from Israel, you better look, destruction is coming. One of the things I think that upholds this nation is our ties with Israel. Amen. That's why I'm vehemently opposed to Iran getting nuclear capability. I think it's a threat to all that region. I don't get political on nobody, okay? not trying to get political or anything. But some of these things are not just political issues. Before they were ever political issues, they were spiritual issues. And, and I refuse to be quiet on spiritual issues. I'm going to speak to spiritual issues. Amen? We've got to bless Israel. We've got to stand with Israel. We've got to stand with them as a nation. We've got to stand with them as individuals. And, um, you know, w- when we look at these signs and these things, it's not anything to put fear on us and put dread. Come on, if you know who you are in God, you ain't got to worry about nothing as far as who you are in the Lord. But I believe it should stir up an urgency in us To be the light that God's called us to be. Because God, I believe, is wrapping this thing up. Was this year, next year, next 10 years? Who knows? God knows in his time clock. I don't. But I do believe that there's significant things. There's something else. And I went over my time here. But there's something else next week that I'm going to get into, to me, that carries even more weight than the flood four blood moons. Four blood moons, you know, there's, there's six of them that, that some significant things happened uh, in the last 2,000 years. Two of those tetras didn't anything really happen historically, okay? But the next thing that I'm going to talk about is what they call the Shemitah. A guy by the name of Jonathan Kahn, he's a Jewish guy. Any, any of y'all heard about the Shemitah? Some of you have heard about the Shemitah and what it is, Shemitah year and stuff. I'm going to share some things about that Shemitah year because, see, in September... During the same time of the Feast of Tabernacles, during the same time of this last super blood moon, at the same time in September, that same month, is, is a day, a little 29, which is the height of the Shemitah. I don't want to get into I ain't got time to break it down. But uh, uh, type in Shemitah, okay? Jonathan Kahn, he preached, shared a word. I, I encourage you, look at where he shared at the presidential inauguration prayer breakfast. He challenged all of Congress and all of them about coming back to Jesus and coming back to God. But it's, a, it's a powerful, powerful, powerful word that, that really parallels with where we're living at in the season we're in. How many realize we're in a different time than we were as a nation? How many of our nations changed? How many of the whole dynamics of the world has changed? You know, with the web that's been introduced, the World Wide Web and the Internet and, you know, all of these different techni- technological breakthroughs and all of these things that have transpired, it has brought us into a different age. This is, this, the generation, the, the, the hour we're living in right now is not the hour we lived in 20 years ago. There is a deep contrast to this dispensation, this time frame, Then even 10 years ago, things have changed so much in such a short period of time. Yeah, I have a pastor friend of mine. I'm going to close. I'm already over. I'm going to close with this one. I have a pastor friend of mine. Many of you know him, uh, Bishop Joel Thomas, awesome preacher. Amen. He preaches here. He's preached here. He's from London. He's a neat guy. He's Jamaican, raised up in England. So he's got the Mon British Brogue accent. And uh, some of you heard him preach. Know what I'm talking about? Great, great man of God. He's in England. I've had the great privilege of preaching, and he's got an awesome church there in a place called Reading, England. And uh, I've had an opportunity to preach there. And one one of the things is we were sitting in his house. We were just talking about different things. He was talking about how England has so uh, had had went away from God, and he was talking about America. And the comparison of how England, it was like they gradually got away from God and the things of God. Matter of fact, outside of Tanzania, when I went went through that airport, London, I had more problems going through London than I did Tanzania or any other airport. I had more. They pulled me to the side when they knew I was a pastor. What are you doing here? It was amazing to me. I thought, wow, man, I I thought this is Mother England. I thought this is where we got the gospel from. But anyway, this is what Pastor Joel said. He said, he said, you know, England just had a gradual decline. 
getting away from the things of God and the secular mindset and, and all the liberalism and all that stuff began to integrate into the culture and, and, and the biblical principles began to be pushed. It was like a gradual slope. He said, but in America, it's been like a steep slope. It's still been a short period of time that we've seen a whole lot happen. Come on, let me know what I'm talking about. And I think all of those are indicators of the hour we're living in. There were people in Bethlehem, in, in Nazareth, in Bethlehem. And, and this is said of them. They missed their day of visitation. I don't want us to miss our opportunity to share the gospel. Because I do believe we're in the last days. Amen. Amen. How many believe God's got people around you? Whether it's guys you work with, people you know, people that are neighbors. There are people around you who don't know Jesus. I don't think we should be waiting for a right time to share the gospel with them. I think we need to be urgent in our expression of how important it is to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Because without that, I mean, we are in real big trouble. People think there's trouble on earth now. They ain't seen trouble till God. When, when God calls the Holy Ghost home, when love's caught up out of the earth, you're talking about some tribulation. You're talking about some trouble. Ain't nobody seen no trouble yet. We think it looks rough in some of the places of the earth. We ain't seen nothing what it's going to be like. Amen? But thank God we have a personal relationship with the Lord. I want you to stand on your feet. Amen? Maybe you're here and you don't have that relationship with the Lord. I'm, I'm not going to prolong this, okay? But if you're not sure about your relationship with the Lord, I wouldn't be waiting. You know, the, you know hey, some things people gamble about and people take risk on. Eternity is something you never want to take a risk on. Because eternity is forever and ever and ever and ever. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask you this question tonight. Do you know you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Are you born again? It's so been that time in your life. You said, Jesus, I'm giving you my life. I'm giving you my heart. I'm giving you everything. I'm going to live for you, God. I want to fulfill my assignment in my hour. I don't want to miss my day of visitation. God, I want to be in the fullness of your perfect will. If you say, Pastor, I'm not sure if, man, if I've really, if I've really committed everything over the Lord. I, I'm not sure if I've really given Jesus everything. If I've really surrendered my heart and my life unto him. But I know I need to give my life to God because... It's not just about you and eternity and heaven and hell. It is about that. Heaven is real and hell's real. But folks, it's, it's not just you. Because when you have a personal relationship with Jesus and you're really walking in that thing, you're really walking in that relationship, it's going to affect people around you when you really got a relationship. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about when you have a relationship with God. You may say tonight, Pastor, I'm, I'm not sure if I got that relationship. My friend, I want to invite you to enter into that relationship. And really all it is is you making a commitment, making a statement from your heart. God, I give you my life. I give you everything, Jesus. God, I surrender all to you. If that's you tonight, you say, Pastor, I want you to pray with me. I'm not sure if I've really committed all my life to God. Maybe you've been running. Maybe you've been half-stepping. One foot in the world, one foot in the things of God. This ain't no time to be playing, y'all. This ain't no time to be straddling the fence. This is a time to be in God. You say, Pastor, I need to commit or recommit my life to the Lord. The Spirit of God's dealt with me. I need to give God my life because I want to be that light that He's called me to be. That city set on a hill that can't be hid. I don't want to have my light under a bushel, oh God. I want you to light me up that all may see and be drawn unto you. If that's you here tonight and you say, That's me, Pastor. Pray for me. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand up. Just lift your hand up high. Amen. Lift your hand up high. Amen. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I want everyone to pray. Thank you. I want everyone to pray this prayer with me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I commit and recommit everything over to you. From this day forward, I'll serve you, Lord. I repent of my sins and with my whole heart and my whole life I turn it all over to you Lord Jesus from this day forward I'll serve you God I'm all yours thank you Jesus for washing my sins away giving me life and life more abundantly 
I receive it now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen, Amen. God bless you.